Welcome to the recorded version of Older Adults and Opioids, part of the Family Caregiver Support Webinar Series brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. Okay, we have two presenters joining us here today. Lakeland Hogan is a gerontologist and caregiver advocate for Home Instead Senior Care. Lakeland works to educate professionals, families, and communities on issues older adults face. Lakeland is a doctoral candidate at the University of Nebraska Omaha, where she is studying social gerontology. She has a Master of Arts in Social Gerontology and a Master's in Business Administration from UNO. Lakeland has professional experience in the private and public sectors of senior care services. She has worked on special projects for UNO's Department of Gerontology and the local area agency on aging. Lakeland serves as Vice President of the Board of Directors for the Dreamweaver Foundation and is active in the Alzheimer's Association's Walk to End Alzheimer's. Lakeland has a passion for helping others, especially aging adults and their families. Also joining us today is Kyle Decker. Kyle is Vice President of Pharmacy at Simple Meds. Kyle received his Doctor of Pharmacy degree from Butler University. He is Six Sigma certified and has spent the last 10 years at the forefront of driving quality health care through medication adherence and healthcare coordination. Kyle is a member of the Pharmacy Quality Alliance, National Community Pharmacists Association, and Indiana Pharmacist Alliance. He is married to Cassie and has one daughter, Ren. And with that, I would like to welcome our presenters, Lakeland and Kyle. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Steve. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Our topic, as Steve mentioned, is one that's very timely, opioids and older adults. This is something that um, across the whole population, not just older adults, has really been deemed as a crisis that we're facing here in the United States. And we know that older adults are at a more significant risk of misuse of these opioids for various reasons that we're going to go over today. And so as professionals working in the field, we need to be aware of the proper use of opioids and the misuse and the risks as it all pertains to older adults. And we know that many of the older adults that we work with on a daily basis are taking multiple medications. And that further complicates the issue as well. And so, again, we're going to go through all of that today, but I'm really excited to have Kyle joining us uh, from Simple Meds. He is uh, a pharmacist by trade, and so he will add some great insight uh, to this topic of opioids in older adults. So before we get started with Kyle's portion, I'm going to just quickly run through our objectives for today. So my hope is by the end of today's webinar, Everyone will better understand the trends of opioid use in older adults. Also, we're going to talk more about those risks associated with medication overuse and the mismanagement of medications, especially opioids. And then we're going to talk about ways that families uh, can address their concerns about their loved one's use of opioids, and then we're review proper disposal of opioid medication, because we know that uh, if not properly disposed of, uh, they can end up in the wrong hands or could lead uh, to other issues such as misuse or overuse. And then finally, we're going to share some resources with you all to hopefully help the family members that you work with, those family caregivers, um, play, uh, help them play an important role in helping their loved one uh, manage their opioid use properly and reduce the risk of misuse or overdose. So with that, I'm going to now turn it over to Kyle, and he's going to walk us through kind of the basics of opioids, talk about what they are and their use. So Kyle, I'll let you get us started. Uh, thanks so much, Lakeland. Well, it's uh, great to be with you all here today. Um, I hope we'll, hopefully you're all having a good Wednesday. Uh, so let's talk about opioids. Um, opioids is categorized and defined as a drug. Uh, and in the human body, it actually interacts with what's called the mu receptor, and it's a mu receptor antagonist. Um, and this means in the central nervous system, you get, you know, the pain relief sensation, you get euphoria, disc uh, decreased respiratory rate, all of those things that we're, we're familiar with um, with opioids. Uh, it comes naturally naturally from a poppy plant, but it can also be produced synthetically. Um, and some prescription opioid examples, Oxycontin, uh, we, we hear about this one all the time, some brand name examples, Roxacet, Percocet, Oxycontin, uh, and then Hydrocodone, Lortab, Vicodin, Lorset are some examples. 
And um, a lot of times these opioids are also mixed uh, within the same tablet with acetaminophen. So on a prescription label, you'll see oxycodone slash APAP, which is the abbreviation for you know, generic Tylenol acetaminophen. Uh, some other examples, codeine, morphine, uh, and then the last three here are all in the same drug family. Uh, fentanyl, uh, which is a typically a duragesic patch, um, and it's also available IV. And then carfentanil and sufentanil are analogs of fentanyl. Um, those two are typically used in anesthesia you know, during surgery or childbirth uh, for sufentanil. And sufentanil also has a sublingual tablet that's uh, got a high street value. As you can imagine, the, the, uh, uh, the things associated with sufentanil that um, users typically want uh, are available in that sublingual tablet. And then illicit opioids, uh, it really the main example here is heroin. Uh, pharmacologically speaking, it's a much dirtier drug than the prescription opioids. Where there's a lot more side effects. There's a lot more uh, enzymes, especially with uh, interactions with enzymes in the body. Um, so flipping to the next slide here, the role of prescriptions. It's really important to understand the role of prescription opioids, you know, their purpose and their use. Uh, it's usually used to reduce the perception of pain. It doesn't actually remove pain uh, from the body, but it reduces the perception of pain and produces a sense of well-being by binding to that mu receptor that, that we were speaking about on the last slide. It's generally used for acute or chronic pain, you know, uh, a bone break, um, uh, back pain, those, towards, those sorts of uh, acute and chronic pain elements, uh, but it's also extensively used in active phase cancer treatment, end-of-life treatment um, to keep the patient uh, comfortable and palliative care and hospice and end of life care. Um, so it can be essential part of uh, prescription opioids can be an essential part of a comprehensive pain care plan. Um, and this is really imperative for those that are, are using prescription opioids. Oftentimes the first line of defense and, and what the prescriber should be doing is offering non-pharmacologic therapy, uh, not opioid treatment um, as a cardinal rule. Uh, this is really all about taking the first step um, in avoiding opioid use. You know, that's something that we want to um, reserve for chronic pain, for acute uh, severe pain, those sorts of things. So the goals of chronic pain therapy are decrease the pain, increase function, improve overall quality of life, and then prevention and elimination of unnecessary suffering are the keys to successful management of chronic pain. I know we probably all have some sort of um, story or uh, real life scenario where opioid use has impacted uh, your life. I'm, I'm gonna take just a second and share one that affected me very closely. Uh, my cousin was a world-class swimmer. He had full ride scholarship to a big 10 school. I know he's not an, elder, an older adult, but um, it affected his life none the same. Uh, he was in his sophomore season. He tore his rotator cuff and post-surgery was prescribed Percocet. And then they, they took a step down to Vicodin. And he quickly became dependent on those, those types of medications, the opioids. And uh, unfortunately, his life spiraled out of control. He uh, ended up dropping off out of the uh, swim team. He um, dropped out of school. He ended up moving back home and getting involved with the wrong group of people while he was out seeking for whatever he could get, whether it's, um, you know, black market opioids or, or heroin. Um, luckily enough, my aunt and uncle were able to intervene. And long story short, um, he was in rehab for almost five years uh, to combat the, um, you know, the opioid addiction that he was having. Um, luckily for us, uh, he's doing much better now. He's um, clean. He hasn't been using um, and he's, uh, you know, out in the workforce. So it's a success story, but many times it often ends differently than that. So let's talk a little bit about the side effects of of opioid use. Um, I'm just going to go down through this list uh, and kind of give you some indication on how often this happens. Constipation is what we hear of mostly in the pharmacy world. This can uh, affect up to 90% of those using opioids. Uh, dry mouth is almost a sudden onset and, and happens around a 25% frequency as well as nausea. 25% uh, of users report nausea and vomiting is up to around 15%. So uh, a lot of side effects of all in, involved with these types of medications. It can decrease appetite. 
uh, drowsiness in around 15% of users, confusion and impaired cognition, uh, tolerance and increased sensitive sensitivity to pain are linked really at the hip. Um, as we talk to those receptors in the body over time, once those are um, activated over and over again by, by an opioid agonist, what happens is the body adjusts those receptor levels and you have to use a higher dosage of the opioid to get the overall same effect. Um, from the medication. So uh, that's really important and something that needs to be monitored, just that tolerance. You wanna make sure that you're not the one that's increasing the dosage. You need to talk through that with your physician. Uh, physical dependence and psychological de dependence is over, to, over 10% of users um, almost immediately uh, have that physical and psychological dependence from these medications. And then depression, um, typically with chronic use, usage of opioids, but uh, it can be an acute, uh, spectrum as well. And then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, increased sensitivity to pain. So really what we want to talk about here is what you want to do as an older adult is discuss these types of health, uh, the side effects with your healthcare provider uh, before you start the opioid. And then after starting the opioid, if any side effect occurs, you need to communicate that to your provider. Um, there are some things that healthcare professionals can recommend to reduce some of these side effects, as, such as taking them during certain times of the day, having uh, exercise regimens in place or bowel regimens uh, to prevent constipation. Oftentimes we see uh, opioids and Miralax prescribed simultaneously just so that uh, that constipation element doesn't come into play. The next slide will talk about uh, risks associated with opioid use. It's really, con uh, it's really key to consider the risk of opioid use, uh, misuse in older adults. Uh, typically, it's recommended that opioids be prescribed at the lowest effective dose, which is around 25 to 50% of the adult recommended starting dose, and then slowly titrating to minimize the adverse effects, particularly those in patients older than 70 years old. Uh, the dosage should then be reassessed at least every four weeks, but it doesn't hurt to do it uh, more frequently than that, uh, even as soon as a week after initiating the therapy. And we really want to um, start with the immediate release formulations and then work towards the extended release and long-acting opioids later, uh, just so that we can reserve, reserve those medications for more severe pain as that takes place. And then really, uh, it's really important about what's really important about misuse is um, what it could lead to. So infectious diseases, um, you know, from injections, HIV, hepatitis C, uh, those types of disease states, uh, withdrawal, organ damage. I referred to the acetaminophen combination with opioids. Um, those play into a, a effect with one another because they're both cleared uh, through the liver. Uh, so overworking those liver enzymes can cause organ damage as well as you know other other organs, not just the liver, uh, and then increased risk of death death with uh, when taken with benzodiazepines uh, or consumed with alcohol. Alcohol is another drug that is eliminated by the liver, so you can um, you can real quickly cause liver damage and liver scarring by taking benzo, uh, uh, acetaminophen, opioids, and alcohol together. So for older adults, we're really more concerned about the last two, organ damage and using multiple substances. Um, and Lakeland's gonna take you through um, additional consideration for older adults and opioids. Thank you so much, Kyle. That give, gives us a really good idea of you know, what opioids are, uh, their use, uh, and some of the risks associated. And I know, as you just mentioned, there uh, are some things uh, that impact older adults uh, and some special considerations that we need to make when when talking about this topic. Um, I, I'm sure many of you uh, work with older adults on a regular basis and know that they are likely to have a higher number of chronic conditions, uh, and oftentimes they have multiple meaning or comorbidities. And so, oftentimes, along with those chronic conditions, are drugs or medications that are prescribed uh, to help um, managing help with the managing of those conditions. Uh, and so then if you were to put opioids into the mix, that really increases the risk for uh, additional drug interactions, adverse drug interactions. So, um, you know, of course, when we work with older adults and, and family members, we need to educate them on this fact that opioids could have a potential to negatively interact with other prescriptions that they have. So, um, you know, it's 
one reason that it's really, really important for families to keep a current medication list and make sure that they have the current medications for for all the different prescribers, because we know uh, people, older people with chronic conditions are likely seeing multiple doctors, maybe a rheumatologist, cardiologist, their general practitioner, and they might all be prescribing uh, different medications. And so if family members can help their loved ones keep that current medication list, uh, that can really help in that conversation if the provider feels that opioids are necessary uh, to treat their pain for the various reasons, then the family members can say, well, this is their current list of medications, and then talk through uh, any sort of drug interactions that could occur. But then we also know that older adults um, are experiencing age-related changes in the physiology within their body, and this can really impact the metabolism of opioids. And as Kyle just mentioned, um, many of these opioids are processed through the liver. And so it's really important uh, to understand that they might metabolize a little differently, especially in those older adults who have poor renal or kidney function. Um, they might have a harder time uh, metabolizing those medications and it could cause adverse effects. So again, one important consideration is those various physiological changes that are happening within older adults. And then um, the last one on the slide here is, is changes in cognition, language, and hearing. As we age, an older adult might have um, deficits in, in these various areas. And there are really uh, two factors to take into account uh, when prescribing or switching opioids uh, for an older adult. Um, and the first is really to make sure that the patient is understanding and is able to comprehend the instructions given uh, with those opioid medications. Any sort of cognitive deficit could lead to confusion. Hearing difficulties in the doctor's office might interfere with comprehension of the explanation of use. Um, so when these drugs are being prescribed, it can be really helpful to have a family member there or to ask the pharmacist uh, any detailed questions or call the doctor back and ask follow-up questions just because the opioids um, and the way that they're prescribed is really important for adherence. And as Kyle mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we want to start, usually they start with a lower dose and work their way up. And so we just want to make sure that older adults are checking in with their uh, provider to make sure that they are following uh, instructions for these various opioid medications. And if they do feel um, like their pain isn't uh, isn't being treated properly at the current dose before increasing that dose, checking back in with their provider. Uh, but again, this is uh, being able to understand how the drug is used uh, and how to understand how to properly, properly dispose of the medication uh, is really important after treatment has been completed. So uh, we just need to be aware of these types of considerations for older adults. And I have just a few more um, here on the next slide. We do know that with older adults, there are some barriers to treatment of pain, and this can result in the under-treatment of pain, which can really impact an older adult's quality of life. I know many older adults who experience chronic pain, and um, so often uh, they're re reluctant to disclose that pain uh, for various reasons. You know, patients might not always be forthcoming about their pain because they don't necessarily see it as important. They think it's a normal part of aging. The aches and pains of getting older are just normal and part of everyday life, when in fact it could be uh, caused by something that is treatable. Uh, but yet they're still reluctant to disclose that to their provider. Uh, and older adults are sometimes less sensitive to pain, and so they might underestimate the amount of pain that they are in. And, and really, um, you know, pain is subjective. Pain to one person uh, is going to look a lot different compared to another older adult. So that's why the assessment uh, of pain is really important to make sure that the pain, pardon me, is being treated properly. And oftentimes older adults, um, they might experience pain in the face of significant events, uh, such as losing a spouse or losing their independence. Uh, they might be going through mourning or depression, uh, and this might manifest in, in pain, but they might not uh, see 
disclosing that pain is important. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about the emotional pain uh, in addition to the physical pain in, in just a bit. But also, uh, in addition to being reluctant to disclose pain, there might be poor communication that really hinders that pain assessment. Um, I just mentioned that sometimes older adults feel like it's a part of normal aging, and so they don't communicate it as accurately, or maybe they'll downplay it to their provider. Uh, but again, it is subjective, and pain tolerances differ from person to person. So it's important uh, for the provider to really do a comprehensive assessment of the lev levels of pain, uh, and important especially before recommending that treatment. And for some older adults, uh, polypharmacy might be a concern. And I mentioned earlier the importance of having a medication list to make sure that uh, the family has the most up-to-date prescriptions that the older adult is taking and in order to reduce any um, event of an adverse drug interaction. And then some older adults have opioid phobia, uh, which really um, is important uh, for providers to understand, and then they can educate uh, their patient on opioids. Uh, I mean, Kyle just did a great job of educating us all on what, what opioids are, the use for opioids, uh, but some older adults might still have a fear of using them, and this could be due to maybe a past sub substance abuse issue that they themselves have experienced or have watched a family member go through. Um, and they might also be a little spooked by the recent media that has been focusing on this opioid crisis. And, um, you know, of course, it's, it's good to have concerns about opioid use and to really get education from your provider on it uh, because of the risks associated with it. And then they might also, um, ha they might also be um, needing some education on, on tolerance of these medications. Again, it's important uh, to explain to the older adult uh, and to and to go slow, low and slow, that's kind of the slogan is uh, with these opioids, is to really start with a lower dose and then increase over time if the pain tolerance uh, becomes an issue. And then, of course, you know, dependence and addiction. That is um, very important to be aware of uh, as a concern or a barrier for older adults in opioid use. Um, it's really important to gather the older adult's medical history, again, especially if there's been past substance abuse before prescribing opioids. And we're gonna talk a little bit later about um, how important it is to try those non-opioid interventions first before prescribing opioids, because there are a variety of things uh, that older adults can try to manage their pain that are not using opioids. So uh, just, again, it's important to keep in mind that older adults might underestimate uh, their pain or uh, may downplay it, but we don't want the pain to impact their quality of life and want to be able to help them manage that pain in a way that they're comfortable with and that will, again, not lead to any sort of opioid misuse. So uh, one area of concern that I find among many uh, family members and individuals uh, that are nearing end of life is the use of opioids and hospice. So I did want to just address that, that quickly as part of this presentation. So hop on hospice um, care, opioids are often used for pain management. And sometimes there's a misconception around this. Fam many families that I've worked with over the years have said that they're afraid to give their loved one uh, these opioid pain medications because of the addictive properties. However, when opioids are used according to the guidelines, it really can help to manage pain. And in the case of hospice, it's likely not to be addictive. Studies have actually shown that when pain is managed and well controlled for an individual with hospice by the use of pain medications, including opioids, people actually live longer than those with the exact same condition whose pain is not well controlled. So when used properly in hospice, again, studies show that people can actually live longer. Uh, so it's important to keep in mind that the goal of hospice care, palliative care, is to keep the individual comfortable. And again, the same rule for general opioid use is often applied to hospice, go low and slow, so starting with lower doses and increasing as needed. And the beauty of hospice, in, uh, from my perspective, is that there is a care team that is checking in regularly to help manage that pain. And so um, the goal of hospice really is, again, that pain management and comfort. Um, and this issue of addiction, um, 
might not necessarily be so much of an issue. You know, addiction is a psychological disorder that's really marked by craving for the substance in order to experience a high or a, a state of euphoria. Uh, and there's um, oftentimes in addiction a lack of control over the use of, of the substance and continued use of the substance, even in spite of the potential harm that it could cause to a person. So again, in the case of end of life and hospice, uh, really the goal is comfort care. It's not to experience that, that high that's often associated with addiction. So uh, it really can be used, uh, again, to effectively treat um, the pain that the ex person is experiencing. And also, after the individual does pass away, hospice companies can help families dispose of medications um, in a, properly so that they're not still in the home uh, with potential to get into the wrong hands or um, just making sure that they are disposed of properly. That's, that's very important. So when we're working with families, if, if we come across this concern, hopefully this slide with the information can help us talk families through um, what opioids are used for in the end-of-life hospice situation. And then we've talked a little bit about addiction, so I do now want to turn to more of this opioid problem. And um, we do know that opioids have been overprescribed in, in certain situations, but because of the heightened awareness of this opioid crisis, this problem is slowly being addressed. Providers are starting, again, with those lower doses, prescribing them for shorter periods of time, uh, such as several days or a week's Forth instead of a month or so forth. And as Kyle mentioned, it's really important uh, to reassess pain every four weeks or more frequently to make sure that that is the proper dosing. And so with this more controlled um, prescribing, hopefully over time this will help to um, curb this, this crisis that we're seeing. But we do know that opioids can be highly addictive. Um, studies out there show that some can be addicted within 30 days, and some studies show uh, that even in as little as one week, an individual can become addicted. Uh, and this addiction occurs when the body becomes tolerant to the dose, and it requires more and more of the opioid to get the same effect, again, to achieve that high. Uh, and so that's why the proper pain management um, with opioids is really important in checking in with, with the provider regularly. And there are high risks um, of overdose. As Kyle mentioned earlier, combining opioids with alcohol or other drugs uh, can increase the risk of misuse or even overdose. And taking high daily dosage, uh, dosages of these prescription opioids can put a person at higher risk. And then taking more than is prescribed, which we talked a little bit so far about um, you know, once a prescription is given, it's important not to increase the dose without checking in with the provider because, again, it can put the individual at risk. For those more illicit or illegal opioids like heroin, those uh, manufactured opioids such as fentanyl uh, could possibly contain other uh, unknown or harmful substances, and so that can increase the risk of an overdose or adverse reaction. And then there are certain medical conditions, such as sleep apnea or reduced kidney function or liver function, that can increase the risk of misuse. And then one that's really important to this webinar and to the population we work with is that age is a risk factor. So those over the age of 65 are at a higher risk of overdose because of the physiological changes that they experience. So it's really important to understand these risks um, when, when considering opioid use in older adults because we have seen that misuse and unfortunately opioid overdose has been on the rise. So I did want to just share with you briefly a couple graphs um, of the number of, of overdose deaths that we have seen over the years. So if you look at the number of overall deaths, you can see that uh, since 2002, uh, it has consistently been on the rise. And really, over the past three years, we've seen a spike um, to over 49,000 deaths uh, related to opioid overdose in 2017. And we know that the rate is higher in men than women. As you can see, the yellow line is uh, the number of female overdose uh, and then the number of male 
uh, is, is indicated with that orange line. And when you break this down, it's between 115 to 130 deaths that occur every day here in the United States due to an opioid overdose. But as we've been talking about, there are different types of opioid, opioids that are out there. Uh, and so this, this chart shows kind of a breakdown in opioid use uh, between pain relievers versus uh, heroin. Uh, so you can see that the opioid use for uh, pain relievers um, have, has been a little more consistent, whereas the heroin has really uh, kind of ramped up over the years. So, uh, of course, these numbers in and of themselves are as what are what is causing um, such kind of a media outcry uh, for this opioid crisis. How is how can we as a society uh, tackle this issue? And so a lot more um, attention has been um, put on this issue. Uh, but for our, our population that we work with, older adults, it's important to kind of separate those statistics out so we can get a better feel for how this is truly impacting the population that we're working with. So when we look at the older adult population from 1996 to 2010, the number of opioid prescriptions prescribed to older patients has really increased ninefold. And we're also seeing um, that some studies have shown that 35% of patients over the age of 50 with chronic back pain have reported misuse in the prescription of opioids in the past 30 days. Um, and then we've also seen a the number of hospitalizations on the rise due to the misuse of opioids in the geriatric population. Hospitalizations have quintupled over the past 20 years. So we're seeing that this is becoming more and more of an issue. And it really is estimated that by next year, over 5 million older adults will have a substance abuse problem as it relates to opioids. And then this past March, or March 2018, I guess we're already into April, time flies, but last March, uh, the University of Michigan's National Poll on Healthy Aging asked a nationwide sample of older adults age 50 to 80 about their opioid use for pain management. And they found that one in four older adults, or about 29%, say that they filled a prescription for an opioid medi medication in the, pa in the past two years. And half of those respondents had left the opioid medication, or pardon me, still had the leftover opioid med medication, and, and very few had disposed of that leftover medication. So, so that study uh, goes to show, you know, that many older adults, one in four, have a prescription, but less than half of them are disposing of them after they are done uh, with their use. And, and that can be problematic. It can get into the wrong hands. Um, and, and so it's really important to educate family caregivers and older adults on ways to properly discard of medication. And we're going to get to that towards the end of the webinar today. But then we also know that that chronic chronic pain is really relevant to our older adult population. And 40% of those with chronic pain uh, are often treated with opioids in some form or fashion. So as you can see, uh, opioids are commonly being used um, by older adults. Um, and so I'm going to just talk a little bit more about opioid use in older adults uh, here on this next slide. And so uh, as we mentioned, age is a risk factor for opioid overdose. And studies have shown that rural uh, older adults are at, at a higher risk as well of overdose. So uh, there's been a focus on, on rural medication management when it comes to opioid use. And, and again, chronic pain uh, is very common among this age group. Um, and so that is one reason that opioids uh, have been prescribed. But we also need to consider pain just beyond the physical pain. As I mentioned earlier, emotional pain can sometimes manifest in physical pain. So when we consider uh, the treatment of pain in older adults, sometimes we need to get to more of that underlying uh, underlying effect of pain. It can come in the form, or it can come due to things such as social isolation isolation and loneliness. Um, this can be especially true after the loss of a significant loved one. Um, if you think about it, if an older adult male loses his, his spouse, um, and maybe that spouse was the one who managed medications or helped um, with his activities of daily living, that could be almost um, 
kind of a a multiple emotional effect. He's lost a spouse. He's mourning. Uh, he's lost somebody who's helped him with his activities of daily living. So maybe he feels like he's lost some of his independence as well. Um, and so, again, just trying to think beyond just the physical pain and looking more at some of the emotional pain that could uh, be con could be manifesting in physical pain or contributing to it. Uh, for those that are retired, they may find that they have a lost sense of purpose, um, and they might um, have also some financial difficulties. And maybe this is due to the, their medical cost to managing their pain or a lack of savings, so that could cause some emotional distress. They may also be grappling with a disease diagnosis or a chronic condition. Uh, again, it could be contributing to their pain, but also creating some emotional pain as well. And again, that loss of independence uh, can lead to things such as depression. Uh, and then decreased physical mobility can take an emotional toll, but also can take a physical toll uh, on, on pain as well. If, if you have decreased mobility, you might not be able to get up and be as active uh, to move your body, um, and that might cause additional additional pain as well. And then there's, the course, of course, the medication management issues, which we know is a huge problem in the older adult population. And then if we add opioids into the mix, it can um, create even more issues. So that's why it's really important to uh, have medications reconciled or um, on a regular basis, making sure that that drug list uh, is up to date so that if a conversation about opioids is brought up, the family member has that uh, to reference. And then one last area of consideration before I, I send it back over to Kyle uh, to kind of close this out is talking about opioids and falls because this is a very uh, um, uh, pertinent issue for older adults. And, and one um, correlation we find is that older adults who are using opioids are at a higher risk of falls than those who maybe are just taking NSAIDs to reduce the pain. So uh, they're actually four to five times more likely to experience a fall. Uh, so risk related to falls is that polypharmacy, that drug interaction. I talked to, I've talked. i been talking a lot about the importance of, of making sure that meds are reconciled regularly, making sure that the older adult has a full understanding of the side effects. Those are all really important. And then the visual and depth perception. We know for older adults, um, their, their eyesight, their depth perception might deteriorate. Maybe it's due to... Um, eye disease such as cataracts, glaucoma, that sort of thing. But then when you consider some of the side effects of opioids such as dizziness or drowsiness, you can see why um, this could create a perfect storm for a fall. So definitely something to keep in mind. And then sarcopenia, the loss of muscle mass, uh, increased frailty. This can put an older adult at risk of a fall in and of itself. But when you think about chronic pain, it might make movement uncomfortable. The older adult might be less mobile, unable to get up, move about, uh, which could lead to increased frailty. Um, but that loss of muscle mass, again, can make them more susceptible to falls. And again, you, you put some of those side effects in, the drowsiness, dizziness. Uh, if you're unsteady and if you don't have uh, proper balance, again, you could be at a higher risk for falls. So some quick tips on how to reduce the risk of falls. Um, I did an entire presentation on, on fall risk reduction, I think back in December, and the recording is out there. So if you want to go back and listen to it, you certainly can. Uh, but here's just some quick ways. So definitely want to screen for any risk factors for uh, falls and want to identify pain triggers. And then also consider non-opioid use options. Uh, this could be, uh, we're going to actually go into more detail in just a moment about non-opioid options. So. Um, I'll leave that for Kyle to talk more about. But then there are also some in-evasive in methods uh, for uh, pain management. And also, I might need to consider changing the therapy from an opioid therapy to something else. And then avoid those long-acting opioids when possible and reduce to the lowest effective dose to help minif minimize uh, the symptoms to titrate the effect of the drug. So I'm going to send it back over to Kyle because he's going to talk about minimizing the misuse of opioids, which is so important uh, to this topic. So Kyle, I'll let you take it from here. 
Thanks, Lakeland. Um, well, as, as Lakeland mentioned earlier, uh, minimizing misuse of opioids is, is an important piece of the puzzle here. Um, and the main thing that we want to talk about is trying non-opioid pain management options first. Um, and I, I think that we're really starting to see this um, in healthcare. Prescribers are implementing this prescribing policy um, and evaluating the level of pain uh, of the individual before prescribing opioids. So as we mentioned, non-opioid pharmacologic therapy, uh, NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that's a mouthful I know, but uh, drugs in this category, Tylenol, Advil, uh, Naproxen, uh, you know, those over-the-counter medications that aren't opioids uh, should be used first line as long as there's not other contraindicated uh, issues with the individual. Uh, cognitive behavior, behavior therapy, um, medications or depression, uh, for depression or for seizures. So we see this a lot, um, especially in older adults. Amitriptyline, clomipramine, and doxepin are the three main ones. Uh, and those are, uh, by definition, actually antidepressants or seizure medications. But they seem to really help with pain management uh, in folks, especially baseline pain management up front uh, in the beginning of pain symptoms. Um, exercise therapy, including physical therapy, this will, it's a, typically a longer uh, time frame to um, get the effects of, of exercise therapy or physical therapy, but it really helps the root cause of the pain typically um, to, get, to get into uh, physical therapy. Um, it can be uh, critical for some folks. Um, intervention therapy, such as injections, there's uh, other non pharmacologic interventions, um, relaxation techniques, exercise and weight loss. A lot of pain for individuals is associated with um, you know, carrying around extra weight. So it's really key to, to exercise and, and have that weight loss feature in someone's uh, uh, plan. Uh, local heat applications and other therapies uh, such as massage or acupuncture are also very helpful. So moving on to, to the next slide is really understanding the pain plan. So uh, tips, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, understanding the expectations of pain management. So more tips to minimize misuse. Um, you need to set a pain management goal with your provider and develop that treatment plan that will help you achieve your goals. Um, you know, it's not something that's typically done or um, um, you don't get the effects of it immediately. Sometimes that takes time. So you want to make sure you set that goal with your provider and then assess the risks and benefits of prescription opioids. Is it worth the risk of taking an opioid? Uh, does that outweigh the benefit or not? Um, and that, that needs to be a discussion with you and the provider. Um, Follow-up if pain is not resolving as quickly as expected. Again, uh, we mentioned earlier that you don't want to be the one that's uh, self-medicating or uh, increasing the dose on your own. You want to make sure that that's always go run by your practitioner, your healthcare provider, and make sure that you're doing the right things. Uh, it may be that uh, a different therapy needs to be taken. Um, and you know, do your do your research on state prescription drug monitoring programs. Uh, this has been um, an essential piece of, of my professional career. Uh, over time, almost every state now has a prescription drug monitoring program. Um, practitioners use this on a daily basis to pull up patient profiles and see what controlled medications have been taken uh, or prescribed by other physicians. Uh, it's really used to identify whether or not it's necessary to prescribe an opioid or another controlled substance. Uh, if uh, unfortunately, in some scenarios, patients are drug seeking. Um, and so that type of thing really helps determine whether or not it's, a, uh, it's an issue at hand or not. Um, a lot of doctors nowadays are doing uh, required urine drug screening uh, during the course of therapy just to make sure that there isn't anything else illicit going on, um, to make sure that the opioid, opiate that's being prescribed isn't uh, having an interaction with some other type of drug that's being taken. And then uh, I guess lastly on this slide is to discuss the tapering of opioids to minimize the withdrawal symptoms that people have once the treatment is complete. Um, you know, as we talked about, it could be acute, it could be chronic treatment, um, but it, at the end of the day, if the therapy is discontinued, then the individual needs some assistance on, on stepping off of these medications. So uh, how to prevent opioid misuse. Next slide is, 
um, I'm going to run through this quickly. I know we're starting to get short on time here is, is really to work with your doctor. Make sure you create that plan and you know how to manage your pain. Um, know your options and consider ways to manage your pain that don't include opioids. So those non-pharmacologic non options that we talked about earlier. And then talk to your doctor about any and all side effects and other concerns and follow up with your doctor regularly. Dependence should be top of mind here. Um, you know, there's obviously benefits to, um, in some instances, taking opioids, but dependence should, in my opinion, always be a top of mind for individuals and talk through that with your prescriber. Um, take and store opioids properly. Um, never take in greater amounts than is prescribed. Again, it leads to side effects. It can lead to organ damage, and uh, you really want to always make sure you follow the directions of your prescriber. Never sell or share prescriptions. This is actually a federal law, um, and if you look at a prescription vial that has that, that contains a controlled substance, it states that it's illegal to share to sell those prescriptions. Uh, and then uh, make sure that you store in a secure place. I don't know how many times I've heard in my career that pain medications came up missing, somebody stole my pain medication, and um, the realization is that oftentimes when they disappear, it's those closest to you that do it, um, you know, those that you trust the most, uh, at least that's been my experience. Um, we want to make sure we're disposing of unused opioids at the end of treatment. Uh, there's a lot of uh, new initiatives out there, community take back programs, sheriff's office, police stations, uh, fire departments, uh, pharmacies have mail uh, back programs where if you call them, they'll uh, provide you with a uh, shipping label to mail your prescriptions back. Uh, and then flushing down the toilet. So it's okay, uh, the FDA actually recommends to flush medications that are high risk down the toilet. Um, it, it's not bad for the environment, according to the FDA, at least these classes of medications. And then lastly, um, we're going to hit on this once again, but don't take opioids with alcohol or other medications. Uh, you get increased respiratory suppression and, and what we talked about, the, the liver and, and uh, kidney dysfunction that can be um, exacerbated by, by taking alcohol, as well as other medications, benzodiazepines, Xanax, Valium, Ativan, uh, muscle relaxants. You just need to more uh, sedation, more respiratory suppression with soma and flexoril, and then hypnotics, so sleep medications across the board. Doesn't matter which sleep uh, medication it is, it does interact, uh, and you do get a, an exacerbated effect by taking those together. So recognizing op op opioid overdose, the, the last slide here, um, the next slide, a key, a key point here is pinpoint pupils. So oftentimes if somebody's overdosed and you, um, if their eyes are closed or open, you can just barely see the black of the pupil. Um, that's a, a telltale sign. Falling asleep or uh, losing consciousness, shallow breathing, again, that respiratory suppression, choking or gurgling sounds, limp body, so muscle tone, there's a lack of muscle tone. And then with that sleep or with that breathing suppression, you oftentimes get low oxygen saturation in the blood. So there's a blue, uh, pale or blue skin or cold skin. Um, if an overdose occurs, so if you stumble upon somebody um, or if, uh, heaven forbid, you, you know, you're part of, of that um, scenario taking place to call 911 and Call 911 immediately. Uh, if it's available, administer naloxone. That's uh, available over the counter in many states. And almost every state, I believe, at this point in time has a good Samaritan law. So whether or not you are involved with that individual's overdose, uh, you can report the overdose and not get into trouble, uh, you know, if you have something to do, if you're if caring for the individual, uh, you're going to be okay and not, um, that the law doesn't apply to you. Um, Try to keep the person awake and breathing. Uh, make sure that, you're, that they're lying on their side to prevent choking if they do happen to vomit, and then stay with them until uh, the emergency workers arrive. And to try to prevent misuse after treatment's done, it's important to keep, um, you know, to dispose of those medications properly as they can refer to earlier. So we're going to go through that real quick. Um, safe drug disposal. Uh, you can throw it away in the household trash. Uh, the best way to do that, as the diagram shows here, is to mix the medication with something that's not palatable, so coffee grounds, cat litter, those sorts of things, and put it into a, a plastic Ziploc bag and then throw it away. Um, you know, this, it's amazing uh, drug seekers will take medication, even if it's, you know, gross, uh, you know, what we would think is adulterated medication, they'll still take it. 
Um, and so it's important that you do dispose of it correctly and when you're done with it to get rid of it. Um, and then the last piece here on, on disposing is, is to scratch out your information. So people that are opiate users that are kind of in that desperate mode, uh, they can track back um, on people, look at prescription vials and find out if you, um, you know, have prescriptions for opiates or other controlled substances and, and track back and, and theft is a part, real problem there. Uh, like I referred to earlier, flushing medications down the toilet is recommended by the FDA, so that's okay to do. And then, uh, as, as Lakeland mentioned earlier, hospice companies can also dispose of your medications for you. And now I think Lakeland's going to close with some resources. Thank you so much, Kyle. That was all such great information. And, and I do have just a few resources left to share with everyone. I know we've been talking about uh, the the, the National Take Back Day, and I did want to let everyone know that it is coming up this month, April 29, or 27th of 2019, is National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. And so uh, their website there is takebackday.dea.gov. Uh, so on that site, I, I believe they have a toolkit. So if you work for a facility or uh, want to uh, post this information at your local faith community or uh, senior center or maybe you're a part of a, a gym, post it on the bulletin board. There's information there. And if you can't make it to the uh, take back day, you can't get there on the 27th, there is your long round um, drug disposal locations that you can find on the same website. Um, and again, that's takebackday.dea.gov. And then a lot of local pharmacies now have a secure drop box where you can drop off medications such as your CVS or Walgreens. Just give them a quick call and see if they are willing and able to take back those types of, of medications. But it's really important, again, as we've been talking about all along, uh, to properly dispose of these medications that can be so highly addictive. And then some final um, resources for you. The Substance Abuse and Me Mental Health Service Administration has a great website with some great information on this crisis. So I'd encourage you to visit that site. Uh, they also have a national helpline. So if you are having issues, uh, you can always give them a call. Um, their number is listed there on the screen. And then there's the RX Awareness Campaign that the CDC uh, has put out. And the website is, is there, cdc.gov slash rxawareness. Um, and there's some great, again, information out there. The U.S. Um, Department of Health and Human Services, they have a poison help hotline. Um, of course, that's important to access if you believe that there has been an overdose. And they're also able to answer questions uh, in regards to medications or concerns. So if you're not able to connect with your provider or your pharmacist or uh, for some reason you, you don't feel comfortable approaching either of them, please feel free to pass that information along. And then again, that drug take back day. Um, and then if you want to learn more about uh, Simple Meds, a great medication management system. Um, they, their website, simplemeds.com, they do full med reconciliations and uh, they pre-package the medication to help minimize uh, medication misuse. So I hope that you find those resources helpful. I know that there are so many resources out there uh, that go beyond this list, but here are some quick quick hit resources for you that I hope you find helpful. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone again for tuning in for today's webinar. This is such an important topic, and we could probably spend hours discussing um, this, this important topic, uh, but we do want to answer a few of your questions. So with that, Steve, I'll hand it back over to you for a few questions. All right. Thank you very much, Lakeland and Kyle. Very important presentation. And uh, let's get right to the questions and answers, everybody. Um, first question here for you. What explains a sudden opioid crisis among older adults? That is a great question. And Kyle, feel free to jump in on, on this one. But uh, I think that, you know, it, it's a crisis that's happening uh, across generations. It's not necessarily older adults um, that are only experiencing the crisis. I know that you know, the stats that we've shown over the last so many years, it has become more and more of an issue. Um, but I think that um, 
I mean, you can't really attribute one one thing to to this crisis. I think it's a combination of of multiple things. But what we're learning, um, and what this is bringing attention to, is really the safe management of of medications, bringing awareness to the fact that these are highly addictive, and that they do need to dispose be disposed of properly, and uh, going over the proper use of them and using them kind of as a more um, acute treatment plan or, or trying to look for alternates will hopefully help minimize this, this crisis over time. Kyle, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, that, those are good points, Lakeland. The only thing I would add to that is um, for a long period of time, uh, studies have shown that patients with in the hospice care with cancer were actually being under uh, prescribed opioids and pain management and their pain was not being uh, handled correctly. And so um, over time, what happened was prescribers would then over prescribe opiates and make sure that there were plenty of pain medications on board. And that, I think, has kind of led to, you know, the more wider avail availability of pain medications and opioids out on the street, out on the market, in people's closets at home. Um, and so now we're, we're trying to sw swing the pendulum back a little bit the other way, you know, with prescription drug monitoring programs with, um, you know, things that, that Lakeland and her team are doing with, with caregiving. And um, we're trying to now address that problem um, while still managing patients' pain. And so I, I, don't, I don't know if that adds to the conversation there, but uh, I know that at one point in time there was a uh, reported under-prescribing uh, under of pain medication and those that need it. All right, thank you. Um, next question, is the risk of addiction as high for individuals that take the medication as prescribed or mainly for those that misuse it? Uh, in, in my opinion, I don't know if there's um, clinical evidence on this, but I believe it, 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 the addiction affects everyone in, uh, individually. So as Lakeland re, uh, referred to earlier, that it can be as little as one week and it can be a, you know, a month before that addiction really takes hold of the individual. Um, so I would say it's a case-by-case -case basis, but if people use the, and take the medications as prescribed, they're less likely to develop that addiction and following the stepwise tapering off once the pain is alleviated. Lakeland, anything you want to add on that one? I think, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Kai. I think that um, you're right. It, it can be very situational, um, you know, if there's any history of, of drug abuse in, in the past or substance abuse, maybe the individual's at a higher susceptibility uh, to addiction. But I think the, the main point, as, as you stated, Kyle, is to make sure that, that uh, the medication is being followed um, in terms of the prescription and the allotted uh, dosaging, uh, and then the tapering off can be important. So um, I think you, you answered it well. All right, thank you. Um, next question, if you have a patient who you suspect or have concerns about they might be misusing or abusing opioids, how do you recommend bringing these concerns up to them? A very difficult conversation. That is challenging. Um, you know, any time that um, you, you suspect that somebody is misusing a medication, any kind of medication or substance, uh, it can be challenging to bring up that conversation. Um, I think it, it also kind of, I, I believe, would depend on the relationship between the individual and the patient. So, you know, if you're a healthcare provider, uh, that's going to be a different scenario than if you're a family member. Um, if you're a family member, this is family caregiver webinar series, so I'll kind of approach it from, from that perspective. Um, you know, if you attempt to bring up the conversation and it doesn't go well, um, it might be time to reach out to the, that individual's um, provider um, to alert them or um, you know, call call the hotlines that that referenced earlier for some suggestions. Um, but it, it can be a tricky situation. Kyle, do you have any other suggestions for that? Yeah, I think I, the only thing I would add is is the point that you just made about it depends on your relationship. Um, you know, I think you got to be sensitive to um, their independence and 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 their privacy. Um, and so. It, it, I think sometimes could just be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You know, I, I noticed that 
your medication is gone, but it shouldn't be gone for another week. Is there anything that we should talk about or talk to your doctor about? Maybe that's the, the best way to approach it. But, you know, being sensitive to their privacy is also key and, and needs to be kept in the back of your mind while you're, you're thinking about those conversations. All right. Well, unfortunately, we have reached the end of our hour and we're just about out of time here. But Lakeland and Kyle, I want to thank you for joining us today for a great presentation on a very important topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.